Bibles to 2 Peter, chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Peter, chapter 2, I've got listed 1 through 22, but I'm only going to read down to... Uh, read down through uh, verse 11 uh, for now. This is a very tough sermon to preach. Uh, I don't like tough sermons. They deal with difficult things and I don't like to deal with difficult things. But God called me as a pastor to deal with difficult things and to lead people uh, on the straight and narrow path. So I've, I've got to deal with it. So uh, we're going to look at verse 1 through 11. But there was also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetous, covet, covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered a righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of, the, out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. There's a great deception that is going on in our world today. Now, if you look out in the world of lost people, it's, it's easy to see. But the real problem is with the churches. When we have pastors that don't lead the people to live holy lives, but instead to just love the Lord. I think there's a, a lot of pastors out there that want you to love the Lord, and, and that's where they kind of stop at. It's easy to get hung up on the scripture, love the Lord your God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and to understand that we have to love people. But few will read beyond those verses. They, they just want the God of love. Uh, these people will have the, well, I love the Lord, and, and I love everybody else. And that's their motto. And they think everything's going to be fine with them. But when it comes to being obedient to God's word, uh, that's not going to be uh, something that they want to do. Now, the sexual revolution of the 60s has created a ripple effect in our society today. Many years ago, having sex outside of marriage was taboo. And those that, that did that, they were probably few and far between. You fast forward that to the 80s uh, and to the generation that I grew up in, and it was, it was common to see someone in high school that was pregnant, as was the case with me and Gina. Uh, we saw that, uh, started seeing that quite often as, as we were getting out of school. Uh, back in the 80s, homosexuality was, was nearly unseen in our society but now it's openly seen and accepted. And then uh, to, to go a step further, I saw something, and I tried desperately to find the news report on it, but I, I could not find it. 
but it said that there was someone that was in England that was trying to uh, promote pedophilia as something that's normal. And that just, that blows my mind away that somebody was trying to do that. But you see, once we begin going down that slippery slope of, of, thing, of doing things that go against God's word, uh, then, then it's going to drop on us fast. And as you can see, as our society has gone down over the years, uh, we are headed in that direction. Uh, there, there is nearly nothing that is deemed uh, unnatural in, in the sexual world today. Uh, we're, we're beginning to see some really strange things out there uh, that are happening. Now, I know that probably uh, every single family in here is dealing with, with some of these issues uh, with somebody in the family, either a friend, a co-worker, somebody that we know that is, that is dealing with these kinds of things. But that doesn't make it right. Uh, when God's word says uh, that we don't do these things, it's understood that we don't do them. Now, I can understand a lost society that doesn't believe in God going out and, and doing these kinds of things uh, in their life. I understand that because, like I said, me and Gina, uh, we were lost when we were in high school and, and uh, we didn't see nothing wrong with what we were doing. But, uh, the problem comes is when we have preachers that are proclaiming these things as not being a sin. Now, I'm not here to call out homosexuality or, or any other sexual sin as the only things that go against God's word. Uh, I think most of those are given in the churches today, we understand that. But you know what, there are so many things that God has said for us not to do that probably many of us in the church do on a regular basis. And these things are sin. Uh, we cannot go against what God's word says. Uh, sin is sin, no matter which way it is committed. So we have to be careful what we're doing in our lives. And the answer to sin is Jesus Christ. He came into our world to deliver us from sin and to change us from the inside out. Now, as I said, uh, I didn't get saved until I was 30 years old, so I had a nature that chased after sin before I got saved. Drunkenness, pornography, lust of the heart, hatred, those are just to name a few of the multitude of sins that I had going on in my life. But then Jesus came into my heart and he changed me. And then I didn't want to pursue that kind of lifestyle anymore. <clears throat> now, when someone chooses to chase after sin in their life uh, and, and go against what God has commanded us not to do, then I, then I wonder, did they really get God in their life? Because if they really had God in their life, they wouldn't chase after sin as, as much as our world seems to be doing. Now, what God's word is saying today is that sin uh, is, is a serious business. Sin is very serious. It was so serious that God destroyed the world, the whole world in the flood, except for Noah and his family. God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and only the righteous man Lot and his uh, two daughters were able to escape that devastation. Now, if God would bring about such devastation to our world back in the Old Testament, why on earth would he change his mind about sin today? Did God all of a sudden become the God of love and not the God of justice as well? You see, God is still the God of justice. He wants us to do what's right. There's story after story after story within these pages that remind us of what happens when his children get out of line and do the things that they're not supposed to be doing, the things that go against his word. It has and it always will be destruction in the end if we continue 
down that path. It's, go, uh, it's probably going to be destruction for the individual, but most of the destruction for individuals spread out into families, and then families spread out into communities, and then communities spread out to the state, to our country, and to our world. So we have to stop it while we, uh, while we still can. Uh, but you know that we're in big trouble when you have godly people that are standing in the pulpit they're supposed to be leading people away from, uh, from the bad things but instead they're leading people straight down the path of destruction they're leading them to hell with their heresies that go directly in conflict with what God's word says you see, our society has to get back to living for the Lord. We have to get back to doing what God tells us and commands us to do. Now, does that mean that we should uh, shun people that are living in sin with no care about God at all in their life? Absolutely not. As I said, God is a God of love as well. We are to love people. We are to show them God's love. We're to care about them and, and, and let them know that God loves them and that is concerned about them as well. I saw something the other day that said, if your religion teaches you to hate people, then you need to find a new religion. And, and I can agree with that. We are not to hate people. We're to love them. But you see, the, as Christians, uh, we're supposed to go beyond loving them as well. We are to hate sin. We can love people, but we can hate the sin that they do. That doesn't mean we hate people. If this world is out here and they see us as hate, then they're never going to turn to the Lord. And I see so many things going on in our society where all I can see, and I see the same things that they're seeing, is hate, hate coming out. They need to see us love. <clears throat> but we need to hate the sin. Now, can I truly love my child, a friend, a family member, or someone else that, that may be on that slippery slope into the gates of hell and not tell them about Jesus and his salvation? Can I not love them enough to tell them about how they can be free from the bondage of sin and not to continue pursuing it. You see, the Lord knows how to deliver people from sin. Jesus can keep us away from temptation, the temptation that might ensnare us or, or lure us away. He can keep us away from all of that. But we have to be faithful to him in order to understand what he's trying to teach us. You see, we need to be careful who we're listening to on sound biblical directions. If the Bible calls something sin, then it is sin, and we need to turn away from it. Now, if the preacher teaches that sin is accepted, that it is okay, then I'm going to tell you, you need to stop listening to that false teacher. Let's look, uh, let's look at verses 12 through 22. But these, like natural brute beasts, may to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who counted pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, 
through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. These false teachers lead people astray to commit all manner of sin. Not only do they lead people away from God, but they themselves are fully living their lives in sin. Now, imagine a pastor that was married that would promote adultery. Now, what would you as a church think of me being a married pastor if I said adultery was okay and that it was okay for me to go out and have multiple affairs on my wife? What would you do as a church? If you were a godly church, I would hope and pray that you threw me on my rear end out of this door as fast as you could carry me out the building. When you have pastors that are teaching wrong things, they are leading people to hell. They're not doing anything for the glory of God. They're not leading people to heaven. They're leading them straight to hell, and we need to be careful who we're listening to. If the pastor isn't willing to follow the scriptures, then it's a good indication that he's going to be leading his congregation to follow suit. You see, God has called us to live godly lives so that we can be an example to you on how you should live your life. So we have to be careful what we're doing in order to make sure you're doing what's right. And we have to lead you down the right path. These pastors are wells without water. Clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, there are some well known uh, preachers on TV, as well as some many unknown preachers, that are preaching empty words. They sound wonderful to the ear, but they have no depth in the heart. Samuel Clement, better known as Mark Twain, once attended a Sunday morning sermon. He met the pastor at the door afterward and told him that he had a book at home with every word he had preached that morning. The minister assured him that the sermon was an original. Clement still held his position. The pastor wanted to see this book, so Clement said he would send it over in the morning. When the preacher unwrapped it, he had found a dictionary. And in the flyleaf was written this, words, just words, just words. You see, if the words spoken by a preacher don't alter people's lives, then they're just words. They don't have any meaning. You see, they may promise freedom in Christ, but they don't lead people to freedom from sin. Jesus came to break those chains of, of sin that bind us and to truly set us free. We cannot have freedom in Christ and still be bound in a life of sin. We must escape our sin and the punishment that would come with our sin by the blood of Jesus Christ that was the atonement for that sin. Many prisoners in the jail system they have a wonderful God moment while they're in jail. They, they get real religious. But then when they walk back outside of the prison gates, they tend to go back to the same things. They go back into the same old environment with the same old people doing the same old sin that imprisoned them in the first place. But you see, many people in the church do the very same thing. They have a God moment, and then it passes and they return back to the life that they once lived. I want to make sure 
that we don't miss this very, very important scripture that I read today. So I want to look back again in verse 20 through 22. And, and, and I want you to hear what I'm saying with this scripture. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. If we come to Jesus, we find salvation through the knowledge of, of his payment for our sin on the cross. And we having received the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And then we turn back away from God. It would have been better if we had never known the way. If we don't know the way to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord, then the answer is hell. And I don't know about you, but I can't imagine anything being worse than hell. But it says it would be better if they didn't ever know Jesus than to know him and go back into living that kind of life. You see, sin is serious business. It has serious consequences. They are eternal consequences if we don't take our salvation very seriously. It is utterly important as to who we should listen to on the radio, on the TV, or maybe it's some other event that we might be going to where somebody is preaching the word. You have to pay attention. You have to know God's word so that you can hear when they speak. Years ago, we had a Friday night service that we held in my garage, oddly enough. But each week we would have different people come in and, and speak. And one Friday night, we had a, a special guest come in. He was supposed to be this big-time preacher uh, in another state that just happened to be visiting uh, that night. And so he was invited to come and speak to us. And he got up and he started talking. And I, I tell you, this guy was, he was probably one of the most entertaining speakers that I've ever heard. Uh, we're all sitting in our chairs in, in my garage and we're all leaning forward in our chairs. We're all excited about what this man is saying. And, and he just got everybody sitting there with their mouth open, smiles on their face, and just happy in the Lord. All up until the moment that he said, you know, in the Garden of Eden, man did not sin. It was God that sinned. And when he said that, everybody sat back in their chairs. The smiles disappeared. And he ended his sermon just shortly after that. And, and we saw why he had lost the big congregation that he had. It's because he was not preaching the word of God. If anybody ever tells you that God sinned, then you need to show them in the Bible where it says God is incapable of sin. You need to know the word of God so that when you're listening to what people are saying, you can uh, search the scriptures to find out if, if the pastor or the preacher, the radio preacher or the TV preacher is speaking truth or if he's just saying a bunch of empty words that make your ears feel all fuzzy and tickles your heart. You see, we need to seek out the truth. We need to seek out the truth in God's word no matter how uncomfortable it's going to make us feel. We need to follow that truth. We don't need to be following heresies. And the truth is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And his desire is to come into our hearts. To save us from our sins. To forgive us of our sins. And to lead us home to heaven. But once he comes into our heart. Then he will begin that process of sanctification. Making us holy. If we're not being made holy and we are continuing to live in our sin, then I'm going to tell you, you're just fooling yourselves. 
God's word is serious business with eternal consequences. We have to be faithful to serve our God according to his directions, not what we can make up on our own. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that you thought so much of us, the ones that are rebelling against you, that you would die for us anyway, so that we can turn from that rebellion, Father, and have that relationship with you. And Father, I know we're still in a sinful world, and, and, and it's easy to, to get uh, caught up in it. But Father, I pray that you, you pull us out of the temptations that may lure us away uh, in, the, in the small sins as well as the big sins, God, because as I said, sin is sin no matter how big. So Father, I pray that you protect our hearts, that you guide us in how we should walk and talk, how we should live and love. And I pray that you strengthen us to do what you want us to do. Father, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.